and the second one is not in. Okay. Um, and uh, so, so Eric is actually just uh, just submitted his thesis on, on on this work, and so so that's um, I guess an important part for him. So so basically, what I, I want to discuss today is really you know it's relatively simple. Uh, the idea is where we made these uh, isotope superlattices of graphene and by alternating carbon 12 and carbon 13. And I'll talk more about how, how we, we, uh, we make these structures. But, you know, just to give you a little feeling of, you know, why is this sort of interesting and, you know, what, what are the things you can think about doing in these systems? Well, you know, just in terms of the aesthetics of it, it's, you know, you can look at these, you can see these nice pictures of, of trying to use an interplay between sort of a, a 1D periodicity and a, and a hexagonic lattice. And you can really see different sort of structures uh, appearing depending on how you you twist like the the super lattice um, with the hexagon with the, with the hexagons. And you know what is important to remember is also that you by by adding this sort of additional one D super lattice, you're essentially um, destroying uh, the intrinsic uh, six fold symmetry. So that that could have sort of uh, important implications too. Um, so let me start with going back in history a little bit. And uh, super lattice have been studied quite a bit. And uh, I would like just to point out a few sort of, I, which I find really interesting results uh, from, from the past. And uh, one of the structures, you know, very standard structures, gallium arsenide, uh, aluminum arsenide uh, super lattices. And uh, on the left, you, you know, on, on the left, you see this sort of nice, um, uh, oops, um, uh, yeah. Um, experimental TM on, on the super lattice. But the, the main point of that is that you can actually observe uh, band splitting. If you, if, you, if you induce this, if you create the super lattice, you will see a band splitting in the Raman spectrum, which can be also understood in terms of sort of the, just the, the theory in terms of looking at the dispersion curves of the phonon dispersion curves. So, so these were experiments which were quite, you know, quite actually uh, date back uh, quite a few years. Um, the sort of, Another very nice set of experiments, which is uh, done in in super lattices of diamond, and this is sort of you know it sounds quite fancy. So they they, they grow these uh, diamond super lattices with both pure carbon twelve and then carbon thirteen, and uh, you have this nice um, image of uh, of super lattices using sims. This is not a video game, but it's um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Iron masses spectroscopy, um, but you know, and uh, what is interesting when you look at the the phonon diagram of that, the phonon dispersion, you will actually also see uh, typically a splitting of some of the energy levels uh, of the of the frequencies. However, what is actually a little surprising is that in diamond, even though you're only changing the, the isotopes, carbon thirteen and carbon twelve, um, what happens? What happens is that you you actually do create also an, an electron periodicity system. So so what happens is that because of the electron phonon interactions, the the different isotopes will actually change the, the effective um, the, the band gap of the diamond, and so you you're going to see a conduction band discontinuity uh, all at the same time as you you would actually uh, change the isotopes, even though structurally it's electronically in principle very similar, but it's the same. But uh, because of this sort of electron phone interaction, you, you still get that. Um, so another interesting uh, example of, of super lattice is the germanium one. And that doesn't have the same problem as diamond in the sense that uh, there the electron band discontinuity is actually very small. It's, it's typically less than a uh, mill electron volt. Um, and so, so then most of the effect is really on, on phonons. And, and that's also, this is a picture of the sort of the, the, the Raman data for germanium sublattices. And depending on the periodicity of this uh, isotope sublattice in germanium, you, you get, you know, you, you have a splitting of two branches of, of, of phonons appearing. So, um, so germanium is sort of an interesting material, but again, all these materials are, are 3D. So what I want to talk about today 
is, is, is sort of the equivalent, but in, in two dimensions. So I really want to focus on this sort of 2D, 2D nature of, of SIPA lattices. And I'll, 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 I'll talk about the, the carbon 12 and carbon 13 graphene uh, SIPA lattice. And so, so there's a few interesting questions I, I would just want to sort of introduce. And maybe let me take also this opportunity. If, if there's any questions in, in, you know, you might have, uh, please, you know, yeah, I'm happy to be interrupted as long as it's not, um, you know, it's, it's a little kind of interruption as in the debate last night. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy with uh, being uh, asked some questions and then um, in between. So if you have any questions, uh, let me know or you can use the chat. Uh, okay, so, so, so the program is, is, is sort of uh, this list. Uh, and uh, what I'll talk about first is the phonon band engineering. And it's really seeing, you know, what happens when you when you create this uh, super lattice with uh, with carbon twelve and carbon thirteen. So so this is, you know, th this is quite recent, and um, the only works until now were theoretical and simulations on 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 sort of uh, simulations on 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 relatively small sized uh, structures where they, they they can sort of see also some uh, signatures of you know some some bands show show a little bit of a splitting and the in the phonon uh, spectrum at some uh, at some position in momentum space um, so I'll talk more about that also experimentally and then sort of a more work on, on what we did there uh, then I'll, I'll discuss the hot electron uh, scattering problem which uh, I think is quite interesting and you know that the, the basic idea is that when you when you shine a laser on graphene and graphene has this famous uh, cone structure so so typically you you would uh, excite some electrons into the from the from the balance band to the electron to the connection band and uh, they, they have sort of really high energy and then what happens to these electrons so, so they, they can basically scatter with either either other electrons or with other phonons and so typically the dominant mechanism is the electron electron scattering at high energy and then this takes place into a few a few tens of uh, uh, femtoseconds and then you would have sort of um, uh, little longer, longer time scales interaction with phonons and and, and other things um, so one of the questions you could ask is well, what is actually the the mean free pass or the scattering lengths of of these hot electrons or the photosynthetic electrons and uh, there have been a number of experiments trying to extract this mean free pass although they all go via the line width so so they basically look at the energy line width of these electron states and from that uh, you can sort of in, 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 infer the, the mean free pass and you get various numbers depending on, on the experiment. So, so some are using RPES, uh, Raman, uh, magnetic field, magneto Raman, uh, again Raman, so this is epitaxiography and this is uh, uh, graphite and you know you get numbers ranging sort of between six and let's say 24 uh, nanometers for the, for the equivalent mean free pass. But the point I want to make is that there's no direct measurement of this mean free pass. So what I want to show you is, is you know, there's a way actually to measure directly this electron mean free pass using these super lattices in, in graphene. And uh, what we get, just to give you sort of a, uh, a flavor of, of, of some of the results, uh, we, we get sort of two numbers depending on whether you put graphene on silicon oxide or on suspended graphene. Okay, so then I'll, I'll discuss about uh, real space uh, Raman spectroscopy and that we need that to understand our data. And it's really following, you know, the quite impressive work by Denis Basco and, and co-workers uh, so over a few years, who, who basically looked at um, Raman scattering and, and trying to understand, well, what is the main contribution to Raman scattering? And, um, you know, the, the main idea is to say that, well, electrons are very high energy, so they can they, they essentially like localized particles. And so you can treat this in, in real space and also essentially semi-classically. And so he came up with sort of a quite profound theories and in, 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 in trying to eval evaluate the intensities, uh, the different intensities in, of Raman scattering and graphene. And uh, we will use this, his approach to, to basically understand our data. And just to give you a preview of, of, of you know, some of the main data we, we, we I'm going to show you and, and try to understand is sort of a, uh, one of the main thing is if you look at some of the uh, structure that so some of the Raman data, we, we see sort of the appearance of, a, of an additional peak uh, in the middle of, of the two carbon 12 and carbon 13 um, bands. And to understand that we, we need this sort of real space formalism of uh, Raman scattering. So I'll introduce that. Okay. Um, 
there's, I'll, I'll just mention a little bit, you know, possible application of these uh, super lattices, and they may need relate to electrothermal applications, and we can measure also the thermal conductivity of these devices. Um, and and you know, this was sort of interesting. This interest sort of came out from an early work by Mahan and uh, collaborators, where basically it identified that there's a minimum in heat conductivity at a certain lattice period. So if you, if you make the lattice very small, you, you have the, the, the heat conductivity will go up again. And, uh, and the same is true when you make the period very large. And so, so it's easy to understand why with large periods you have an increased heat conductivity is because basically you have less scattering at the interfaces. Uh, but at small periods, you also have an increase in the heat conductivity, and that's because of, um, of coherence in the phonon system, because most of the heat conductivity is expected to be through phonons. Uh, so I'll, I'll discuss a little bit of that, and then people did sort of similar, this, his work was theoretical in sort of uh, various 3D systems and 2D systems, uh, and then there's also recent, more recent work in, in, in graphene uh, modeling, trying to, to calculate sort of the thermal conductivity, and, and they see the similar structure where you have sort of a, a special minimum in the thermal conductivity at a certain uh, size of, of uh, lattice period, and it's around six or seven nanometers where they see this dip in the, the minimum thermal conductivity. Um, you know, possible applications, you know, now it's getting cooler, which is not as important, as interesting, but imagine it's really hot. You have this jacket I found on, um, you know, on, on the web, you can buy these air conditioning jackets, uh, which cool your, you know, directly your, your body using air conditioning. Um, so imagine replacing this jacket with sort of a thermoelectric device like graphene, you can basically reduce this, uh, it would be much more portable and so on. So, you know, that, that's, so a lot of people are interested in, in basically uh, low thermal conductivity materials, but which are good electrical conductors, because this leads to sort of a, a nice, uh, a, big in, a, big increase, a big increase of the figure of merit, ZT, which is basically proportional to the electrical conductivity and inversely proportional to the thermal conductivity. Um, and, and what is interesting, so this jacket with real air conditioning actually costs about uh, half of what, uh, I guess, Trump paid as taxes uh, recently, but okay, <laughs> uh, on the side note. Um, so topology is potentially quite interesting also in terms of um, isotopes, uh, super lattices, and, uh, but I, I won't have time to much go into much detail, but the idea is that by, by looking at an alternating mass system, you can actually um, trans you can show that it's, it's essentially equivalent, the topological states of, of this alternating masses would be equivalent to an SSH model which show topological edge states uh, at the edge. And so, so there's sort of interesting topological considerations in these uh, uh, isotope super lattice you can uh, think of. There's also nuclear spins and, you know, I, I mentioned nuclear spins, although I will, I will not go into much detail on that, but this is really the reason we started actually working on these isotope graphene is because we were, you know, we were interested in, in, in nuclear spin effects, but um, so, so there's, I think, a lot of interesting things still to be done there, but um, I will, this will not be, I will not discuss this much more here. Uh, okay, so let me start with how do we actually make these structures? And, uh, you know, uh, and again, please uh, let me know if you have any questions. So now uh, I'll introduce uh, how we make these structures and, you know, it's relatively simple. So, we, we essentially follow the recipe from the Austin group, which started synthesizing graphene using chemical vapor disposition in 2008 and then 2009 on, on copper. And the basic idea is that you, you heat to your copper surface, you put it in, a, in an oven, and then uh, you flow some gas of methane and uh, hydrogen, and then it basically creates a, a nice uh, single layer graphene. Uh, what is special in our system is that we, we mostly use a, a vertical a vertical chamber uh, oven, which is a very small, so it's a very efficient way to actually grow graphene without wasting too much of, um, of, of the methane gases. And especially, we are also looking at the, using carbon-13, which is more expensive, and so it's a way to, to be more efficient in terms of uh, uh, the usage of isotope uh, methane. Um, so once we grow this graphene, you, you can characterize this, and, and you know, the obvious one is, is Raman, and Raman essentially, you know, you, 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 you inject a, a green laser and red light comes out. And uh, this is sort of an example of a, of a single uh, crystal of uh, graphene put on silicon oxide. And um, what, what Raman does is basically the light scatters with electrons, electrons will scatter with phonons, and uh, depending on the mass 
of atoms, uh, the frequency will be affected. And so you get this nice sort of um, Raman spectrum of, of graphene, which depends on, on the mass of the isotope. And so the, the red one will be basically um, heavier and that's why it's high frequency. So it's a carbon, oh, sorry, it's lighter, it's carbon 12. And the blue one, which is carbon 13 is lighter. And so it's gonna be, uh, uh, sorry, heavier. So it's gonna be um, lower frequency. Um, so, and, and uh, you know, the, I'm gonna focus on, on sort of uh, only a few of these and mostly the 2D, which is the strongest peak. The, the G peak and the, the 2D prime peak. And, and you see, you know, both of them show, all of them show a nice sort of splitting and uh, depending on the isotope. So what happens now if you mix these isotopes in a, in a random way? And so you can imagine, you know, having carbon 12 and carbon 13 sort of randomly mixed in this graphene. Um, and then you can do Raman spectroscopy. And this is for the 2D uh, Raman peak. What you see is that, you know, they look very similar, except that the position in uh, you know the, the Raman shift is is changed depending on the concentration. So for pure carbon twelve you have sort of the highest frequency, while for pure carbon thirteen you have the lowest frequency, and then in between you have sort of any frequency you want. But other than that, there's not a big change in in sort of the what the spectrum looks like. So so we use this um, and we made a single crystal with different isotope concentrations, and and then and that's how you get these sort of um, uh, discrete traces of, of, of spectra or different spectrum depending on the position along sort of that sample. And, uh, what, and then you can plot basically the position as a function of the fraction of carbon-12 uh, carbon uh, um, uh, isotope. And uh, you get actually something which is very linear with concentration. And it, it shouldn't, you know, theoretically it's not clear why it should be linear, but uh, the point is that if, if you just if you do simple the simplest mass argument you you get this expression here, which is very similar, which is basically almost equivalent to a linear case, down to sort of a 0.5 centimeter minus one inverse uh, um, wave numbers, and so essentially you wouldn't see the difference between these two expressions, and so you say okay it kind of makes sense that it's linear with concentration. Um, and uh, we, we get, you know, we, we can show that it's linear down to essentially 1% resolution roughly. But it's actually, it is actually surprising that it's so linear. And uh, this is an old work, kind of older work uh, from uh, um, sort of in, in the beginning of 2000, where they look at the diamond, so at diamond the different isotope concentration of diamond. And uh, what they see is that there's, um, the, the, the linear slope is the dotted line, but there's basically, uh, if you plot the Raman frequency as a function of concentration, it actually doesn't follow this linear slope. So it's quite different from graphene. In graphene, the, independent of which peak you're looking at, whether it's the G peak or the 2D peak, you get this linear dependence. But in diamond, you don't do it, get the linear dependence. And the main difference is that in diamond, the electron phonon is quite important. And that's why, because of the presence of a, of a large gap, you will actually also affect the, the Raman frequency when you change the, the phonons. Um, Okay, so what can you do with, with these, um, uh, you know, the varying concentrations? And I like to show this uh, because it's a nice movie. It's, you know, it, it allows us actually to, to, to see how graphene grows on, on, uh, on our sample. So this is a movie of, uh, which was made by using sort of a, a linear uh, evolution of, of isotope concentration. And uh, I, I, this is also to show sort of how, how graphene grows um, uh, dendrites and you can basically visualize this uh, using this sort of um, isotope, uh, different isotope concentration. And so, so this is uh, yeah, trying to extract the speed. And then this is, you, you can also see what happens, let's say if you had um, uh, take a bigger viewpoint. And so you, you see that graphene starts growing sort of at different nucleation sites and then eventually starts merging together to form a, a large, uh, Large, a large surface, and then you can have sort of full coverage. Um, so, so, so the way this is really done is, uh, is you know, it, it, essentially what we're monitoring is the peak, what we do as a function of time. So we basically vary the, as a function of time, we vary the concentration of, well, let's say carbon 12 over carbon 13 in, in a linear way. And so um, since we know 
and then we basically measure the, the Raman positions. So from the Raman position, from the Raman peak position, we can get, get the time. So we can basically do a Raman measurement of the, uh, of the 2D peak position and translate that into time. So, so where you can see how the graphene actually grew over time. Um, so, so this is sort of a, an, a way to, to better look at what the dynamics of this graphene growth is. Okay, so, so let me move on to, to sort of consequence of, 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 um, of periodicity. Um, and so, so now imagine instead of doing a, a continuously varying uh, isotope, we're going to sequence the carbon-12 and carbon-13. So essentially what we do is we, we basically alternate the, the gas flow of carbon-12 and carbon-13. So we have sort of a, a peak and first in carbon-13 and then carbon-12. And it's important to leave a gap between these two so that you, you don't have too much mixing with them uh, between the carbon-12 and the carbon-13. So then if you go along sort of the, the, the sample, um, you will actually see this alternating pattern of carbon-12 mass and carbon-13 mass. And then, you know, imagine you're growing a relatively big crystal, you, you can sort of focus on, on the region of that crystal and, and you get essentially a small uh, super lattice of uh, carbon-12 and, and carbon-13. And that, that's really what, what we, we, we're looking at. Um, okay, so, um, so, so what do you expect? So, so what, what do you actually get for in terms of the phonon? So if you have a pure system, uh, you can look at the phonon dispersion in in, in plane phonon dispersion. You can you can you know uh, plot the the Brillouin zone, and then you know as a function of direction, you get sort of um, your in plane uh, dispersion of graphene. So so now imagine instead of having pure carbon twelve, you add some periodicity. Okay, th th this is just to as a labeling, uh, showing you the labels between the different peaks. So um, so this is phonon dispersion, and and I think what is important to I want to show is that uh, we're going to we're going to spend, we're going to focus right now a little bit on on the D prime peak, which is the highest energy uh, phonon, uh, you know, Raman phonon we 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 have. So 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 what happens when you add a periodic system? Well, in a periodic system, uh, let's say in, in this case we we you know we will just theoretically compute the, the phonon dispersion, and what you get is uh, that there's going to be some regions where you have sort of uh, band this. Uh, discontinuity, discontinuity in the dispersion um, because of this added, added uh, periodicity. But at first, there's not a huge change. Um, and, and the average position here corresponds to having, uh, so th this would be the dispersion you would get if you had a carbon 12.5 graphene. Okay, so that's sort of the, the, the reference we, we use here. So imagine you, you make the period, and this is a zoom, zoom in of the optical regions. Uh, now imagine you make the period a little bigger, then you, you start getting more effects in the, you know, you, you get more features in sort of the, the phonon dispersion. Um, and then if you make it even bigger, you essentially get a splitting. So you, you, you essentially get two independent uh, phonon modes um, corresponding to carbon 12 and carbon 13. And that's for the optical ones. For, for the optical ones, you have a nice uh, splitting, but for the uh, acoustic ones, you see that there's not a splitting yet. And so at, 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 this is for a period of 18 nanometers. You, you actually don't expect any splitting of the acoustic mode, but only a, a splitting of the, of, of the optical modes. Um, okay, so, so you can look at this as a function of period. And this is looking at the um, uh, gamma point, what, what would be the density of states at the gamma point as a function of the super lattice period. And you see that, you know, it start at sort of the, the halfway in, which is would correspond to the average mass of 12.5. And then when you make the period bigger, you, you get basically a carbon, uh, this will be the carbon 12, and this would be the carbon, corresponding carbon 13 sort of density of state. And then in, at smaller periods, you get this mixing. Um, experimentally, we can only reach down to six nanometers. So we actually don't see this uh, curving in, unfortunately, uh, yet. Um, you can look at also the local density of state as a in a periodic system. So if you have this periodic mass uh, alternating between 12 and 13, um, you see that the, the highest energy phonons, they, they, they're also going to oscillate uh, periodically with the masses. So you only have essentially carbon uh, 12 at that 
at the high energy um, in the high energy bands and carbon 13 at the low energy bands uh, while uh, the d band which is a little lower in, in in frequency you can have sort of also some uh, mixing between sort of the uh, the, the the isotope uh, the phonons um, you can also look at the transmission and so here i'm, I'm comparing just the the gamma point and the, the K point, which is low energy. And you see that if, if I look at, you know, how phonons are transmitted through the super lattice, in the D mode, it, they, they don't really care too much about the super lattice structure, but at the high energy, they will care a lot. So you, you see that in this regions, you basically have no, no more transmission of phonons because of the, of the, of the super lattice structures. And this is true only for these high energy um, uh, phonon modes. So, so, so that's the, so, so yeah, the, 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 that, that's sort of what, what we expect in the, in the band, in, in the band diagram of, of these super lattices of, of, of and phonons. So let me now go to, to the, to the hot electrons and uh, real space Raman spectroscopy. And uh, the goal here is really to try to, to understand this additional central peak appearing when you decrease the, um, the super lattice period. And, and you see that there's a very different behavior between the 2D prime, 2D, and G peaks. So, so the, the 2D and the 2D prime uh, have the central peak, but not the, but not the, the G peak. And, uh, and we'll, we'll try to find, you know, try to understand what, what was actually going on, which is quite interesting. So uh, the G prime, I said before, is usually the highest energy uh, phonon you, you can measure. And so, um, if you look back at the Raman spectrum, that this will correspond to, to two D prime phonons, which are all, all the way up here. Uh, a single D prime phonon is, is, is low in energy. So, so how, how can we understand this sort of um, two D prime Raman scattering event? Well, there's sort of the standard uh, picture, which is due by uh, Thompson and Reich back in 2000, uh, which basically proposed this following um, uh, mechanism. So imagine you have a, a, a photon coming in at, at some, let's say, 2.4 electron volt. So you're coming in, you're hitting, you're basically uh, hitting a hole up to the conduction band. Um, and then that electron can scatter with a phonon um, and then uh, loses a little bit of energy corresponding to the phonon energy. And the same can happen with a hole. The hole can, can scatter with another phonon. Um, or the same phonon with opposite momentum. And then what happens is that the electron will, will, will be sit up here and the phonon down here. And so they can recombine to emit uh, a photon, which, is, uh, which has a lower energy by, by basically two times the phonon energy. Uh, and so, so that, this is how they explain the appearance of this uh, 2D prime peak and also uh, similarly to, to the 2D peak. And uh, so, uh, so could I ask a question? Yeah, sure, um, go ahead. What hole does it find down there? Not the one it left. So, so in, in that picture, it's the hole uh, that left, yes. I, um, <laughs> and so, yeah, the oh, argument they both, against they to both say that. Scattered. They both scattered. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Yep. Yes, so, so the hole scatters and the electron scatter. Both scatter um, was opposite phonon. They momentum. have to scatter identically, yes. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you. No problem. And so, so let's look at this picture a little more detail. Um, and so, and compare that with what happens for the D prime case. So in principle, what happens is that these electrons, if you kick up an electron in, in high energy in the conduction band, it's a high energy electron and it will scatter a lot with other electrons and phonons. And so you get a quite a broad line width, which is maybe of the order of, of 100 milli electron volt or 50 milli electron volt. Um, and so, so that, that this is sort of uh, why I, I drew this, these lines broader and, and the higher the energy go, the, the, the broader the line width you expect. Um, and so, so how, how do you, how does, so this is the 2D prime we, we looked at. What happens if, how do you create a single D prime phonon? Well, it's, this, it's almost the same thing. You basically kick up the, the electron to the, um, to the connection band and then that, that electron will scatter with the phonon but the hole, instead of scanning with another phonon, will basically 
had to scatter with something else to, to get the same momentum as the, the electron which was uh, scattered by the phonon. And so, so one, one option is that it can be scattered by some defect. So, um, so this D prime state will only actually appear if you have enough defects in your graphene. So if you have a very clean system, you, you, you almost don't see a D prime uh, peak. Uh, so, so this is sort of the conventional picture of, of, of um, well, let's say, I would say Raman spectroscopy. Uh, the, the G peak, which is sort of the, the zero phonon, is, is interesting too. Is uh, so you you come in with your your phonon, with photon, you excite it, and then the idea is to say, well, the, the electron will basically scatter with some gamma phonon, which has no momentum, and so loses energy. But what, what is you know what is important to note here is that um, when it scatters with a zero momentum phonon it doesn't live anymore in, in, the, in the electron dispersion. And so it has to be, go into a virtual state. Um, and so it turns out that if you really try to calculate all the um, contributions to Raman scattering, this state is, is going to be, for a perfect cone, this state should, should be completely absent. But because the cone in graphene is not perfect, but it is sort of a, a warping effect, a trigonal, trig trigonal uh, warping effect in, in, in the cone, uh, that actually you can actually see the, the G peak in, uh, in graphene. But, but I think what is important to remember that it really uses the, the presence of a virtual state uh, to, to create this sort of um, uh, Raman scattering. So, um, you know, you, you can look at, this is sort of, uh, let's say that the standard picture I presented early on, uh, you, you can also view that in, in terms of Feynman diagrams, which may be more familiar with some of uh, other people. So the, the idea is that, you know, again, you, you have the phonon come in, you, you create the electron hole, um, uh, and then the electron scatter was a phonon, and the hole scatter was an opposite moment of phonon, they recombine and you create sort of a, again the, the the final state. So so that's one possible Feynman that that's one diagram of the processes. And so so the reason I'm showing this is that there's many possible diagrams or possibilities of, of scattering. And uh, um, essentially the one I, I just showed is equivalent to to A. Um, and uh, but you have other 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 processes too. And I'm I'm only going to be interested in the ones where. I want you to focus sort of on the on the phonon branch. So in this diagram here, you see that the two phonons are created sort of not at this in the, the same uh, at the same point at the scattering site, but in in this diagram, which is also possible, they would be scattered in the same location. Um, and uh, here, it's the the same is true for the photons. And so you know, since since uh, Rick is here, I also felt that it's and and we we're going to essentially neglect these two and and this one is a little bit of a question. But let, let me show you another way to to think about Raman scattering of the two D prime. And uh, I hope I'm not dis distorting uh, your image, uh, Rick, of how you understand the the two D prime system. But um, it's a very neat idea where you know. And I think my impression that it's sort of equivalent to, to maybe this diagram, but I'm not sure about that. That's something I think we should discuss more. But the, the idea is basically that, um, I think Rick's idea is that you, you can, what is special in, in graphene is that you, you, when you create this, um, when you scatter with a photon, you're creating an electron hole pair, but, it, but you're actually not creating just the pair, but you're also creating uh, sort of a, a triplet with the phonon attached to it. And so you have this sort of a triplet system created by the uh, optical excitation. And then again, uh, that triplet system is, the same thing happens when, when you, uh, you, you create the, you, you, it gets absorbed again. And, and what is interesting with this picture is that you can then use this entire cone structure and slide from bottom to top uh, along this cone. And that's one reason, uh, I guess, Rick argues that it's, it's, it has a high amplitude in, in, in Raman scattering. So, so my feeling is that it, it may, I, I think it's a little bit similar picture to, to this Feynman diagram, but I, I'm not sure about that. Um, but, but what I will do in this talk, I will, I will basically just focus on, on sort of this image here. Uh, which, uh, which, which I, I think is, is quite relevant to our, our experiments, um, and so, so I, I, let me introduce this this idea of, of real space Raman spectroscopy by uh, uh, Denis Basco, uh, and the idea is that really, you know, you you you're exciting an electron, um, and a hole when 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 the photon comes into your graphene system, and the the, the energy of the electron and the hole is, is very high. And so it's basically a local, almost like a local particle. Uh, the wavelength is very small compared to anything else. And so you can essentially treat that as a classical particle uh, bouncing around. And so it has some momentum, 
uh, both the electron and hole have some momentum, and in principle, they, they're created with opposite momentum. And then if they scatter with two phonons with opposite momenta, they will, will basically, uh, uh, they will be scattering back together. And that's sort of this, this picture uh, Duny describes and calculates also the intensities, uh, which uh, we, we basically just adapt to, to the super lattice structure. Um, now, how does it work in the super lattice? So imagine I, I'm creating, so um, I, I'm creating the incident phonon is, a photon is here and I'm creating an electron uh, to the right and a, and a hole to the left. They, they basically go apart for some time until they, they scatter. And if they, if they scatter uh, the phonon with, a correct, with you know, the right momentum, they will, they will be scattered back and the hole the same thing. The hole will also be scattered back and recombine. And, uh, but what is interesting is because the, the electron wavelength is so small, and, and the same is true with the, then the phonon wavelengths, that this process of the electron scattering with a phonon is a very local process. It has to be sort of in, at the nanometer level. And so, so these two phonons can then be created at two different positions in real space. And that's really this whole idea of the real space uh, picture is that uh, you really can imagine having these electrons and holes um, moving around in, in real space and then hitting phonons um, back and forth. And, and so if this happens at different regions of the, of the, of the super lattice, uh, the, these two phonons will be of different uh, frequencies. Uh, well, if, if this happens in, 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 in the same, uh, let's say carbon 12, you only get, let's say red phonons, or if it happens in, in, the, in, the, in only the carbon uh, uh, 13, you would, you would get blue, only the blue phonons. So, so we, I'm not going to go in detail on calculating this, but because it's, it's very semi-classical, it's, it's relatively easy to, to come up with sort of equations to calculate the strengths of these different processes. So you have basically these four possible processes, either you create two, phon two carbon-12 photons, uh, phonons, uh, mixed phonons, one way or the other, or two carbon-13. And so, so we, can, we can compute sort of, uh, or get a, a feeling of what, what this sort of um, fraction of mixed process will be comp as a function of lattice constant. And the important parameters is going to be the, the mean free pass of the electron and hole. How, how far can the electron go before it scatters? Um, and also the, the super lattice uh, periodicity. And so, uh, so this is basically the, the expression, the approximate expression we can get from this very simil simple semi-classical picture. Um, and so, so let's apply this to the data. And so this is the data as a function of, um, uh, so, so we, we're looking at basically the, the size of this middle peak as a function of uh, the period and the period of the super lattice is going down there. And then we plot this as a function of inverse super lattice um, period and following, and then the, 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 the straight line is basically the simple formula and the data is, is basically the dots you see in there in, in red and, and black and red is, is basically just graphene which is suspended so it has a higher mobility while and while the, the black dots are the is graphene on silicon oxide where you, you, you expect quite a bit of scattering. And so you see that that actually the, the simple expression fits very well and uh, what is important it depends on, on these two parameters on, on the on the inverse super lattice constant, uh, super lattice uh, periodicity and the uh, um, the mean free pass, and that's the total mean free pass of electron. And it doesn't matter, you know, with what they scatter. They might scatter with electrons first, and that's uh, that's still uh, that basically just reduce how much uh, Raman scattering uh, you will, you will have. And so so it's so in that sense, it's a and you can do this for the 2D peak and 2D prime, which are very similar. And then you can basically extract numbers you get uh, by by doing a proper fit, and you get basically the the electron mean free pass of these high energy electrons. Um, by, by fitting to, to this simple curve. And it, it's mostly given by, by, the, by, the, by the slope of these two curves. So, so that slope is essentially driving how fast you increase this sort of um, middle peak. And um, so just to summarize sort of the, this picture, so what we see is, you know, so, so when you have a very short period, you can have, the, you can have a lot of these mixed structures. And if you have very large peers, you have much fewer of these um, uh, mixed processes. Uh, so this is for the 2D prime peak. And so, so, so you know, the, this blue would correspond to this frequency, red would be for the high energy ones, and then the mixed process would be sort of the, the central peak. 
Now, what happens for the G phonon is quite different because here you're only creating one phonon. And then you can create two types of phonon, either you know, the phonon in the, in the blue region or the phonon in the red region or carbon 12 or carbon 13. And that's why the G peak will never split uh, beyond two because there's only one phonon you can look at. And it's only uh, what is special here is that you can have basically a mix in the, when you have two phonons, you can sort of mix up the different possible uh, phonons you're creating. And, and that's really what, uh, what, what is the origin of this central peak. Um, so, um, you know, just to summarize this again, so if the mean free pass of the electrons is much larger than the super lattice um, uh, periodicity, you get three peaks. And if it's much smaller, you get only these two peaks because, you know, electrons cannot go far enough away for that. Now you can, I don't have that much time left, but uh, you, can do, you can do the same thing with three, three phonons and four phonons, but, uh, um, and, and you essentially can, can see the same picture with three phonons. And you can also do that with acoustic and optical phonons, which leads to sort of a similar, similar, uh, similar aspect. The data is not as clean because the, the processes are smaller, but you, you, you sort of, uh, it, it all follows the same idea. And then the final sort of uh, proof of that is, is uh, polarization. So imagine now you, are, you, you shine in light with a certain elect electric field polarization then what happens is that if the, if the polarization is along the super lattice, you're going to create more of these, sorry, if, if, if the electron hole pairs is created sort of along the periodic structure, you're more likely to produce a mixed carbon-12 and carbon-13 phonon. But if your, if your electron phonons, if your electron hole goes sort of parallel to the, to the super lattice, then you, you don't expect much uh, difference. And so um, you es essentially only expect carbon 12 or carbon 13, but not a mixed uh, ratio. And so, so we looked at, you know, how does the, the middle peak change in sort of perpendicular and parallel to the, to the super lattice. And we see that if it's uh, perpendicular, so um, meaning that the electron holes is, is going sort of along the periodicity, then you have a strong middle peak, but if, if it goes sort of, if the electron holes go sort of parallel to the super lattice, you, you basically just get a small um, middle peak. And so, you, and, and it fits relatively well what you, you expect sort of from, um, from a polarization dependence. So, so this is sort of a further, uh, you know, let's say consistent result that polarization will depend on you know, what is the direction of the electric field with respect to the uh, super lattice uh, periodicity. Okay, so, so, so this leads me to, the, to my last uh, topic, which is the thermal conductivity. And um, so- and, Sorry, you know, sorry, can, can I make a question, a quick question, please? Yeah, um, no. So the, the values uh, you just showed uh, for the mean free path, um, they are for which temperature can, um, yeah. So, so these ones. Yep. Yeah. So, so this is uh, this is essentially room temperature. So, room temperature. Uh, okay. um, yeah. That, that that that's the mean free pass you would ex. Yeah. We we get for in, in these two systems. Um. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, yeah. So 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 let's look about the you know thermal conductivity. Expect something to happen, which is quite interesting potentially with um, the 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 super lattice. And so let's just look at some you know, all the results on, on germanium, which is also quite interesting. And so this is some uh, results again by the Hello group where um, they, they looked at uh, the thermal conductivity for either pure germanium, which shows sort of a very high, well, well relatively high thermal conductivity. And then they also measured uh, a super lattice sample in germanium, but this is a, this is a 3D. So it's, it's basically layers of uh, alternating uh, isotopes. Um, but the, what they show is that the, the lowest thermal conductivity they, they could measure is from uh, germanium super lattice. And then in between, you, you, so if you add a little bit of, uh, of, of random isotopes, you get sort of into intermediate regions um, in thermal conductivity. And then the, the group, uh, the Ruoff group, um, did something similar in, in, um, in graphene, uh, where, where they looked at the difference between pure carbon-13 and um, and sort of a mixed carbon-13. 
And uh, well, basically the idea is that if you're mixing carbon 12 and carbon 13, you, you're, you're suppressing the, the thermal conductivity. Well, if, if you make a very pure sample of, of only pure carbon 13, which is the red trace, you get the highest possible uh, uh, thermal uh, conductivity. So it clearly shows that you know, adding randomness in the, in the phonons will, will basically suppress the thermal conductivity. And so, so we were interested in, in seeing that what happens in the super lattice. So how, how, how are these measurements done? And this is essentially following the recipe by a Rudolph's group, is what you do is you, you take your, your graphene um, crystal, which is you know, super lattice graphene, and, and put it on these, uh, on these small holes. So you, so you have basically, the, these holes are several microns in, in size. And, um, and then you, you come in with your laser and uh, you shine on, on, on the holes. And because the laser has there's sort of some absorption between the, the photons and the graphene, it will heat up the, the graphene. And so it's your, your temperature source. And then uh, you can measure the temperature of the graphene because the Raman spectrum will depend on the temperature of the graphene. So, so you both have a way to, to induce temperature and, 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 and measure the, so you put in, depending on the power of, of the laser you put in, you're changing how much uh, heat you put into the system, and then you can measure the Raman spectrum, which it gives you the temperature of the of the graphene. Um, and so um, we also did simulations on the super lattice. So, so what you see is that so the laser spot is sort of in the middle, and then clearly you're going to see these sort of steps and steps in temperature. So the graphene will basically cool down while it's it's heated up in the middle, but it cools off when when you reach sort of uh, the outer outer sides of the um, um, of the of the ring of the of the suspended ring, and um, and you can measure sort of these these different uh, parts. And then this is simulation. So you what you see is that the temperature basically uh, goes in steps as a function of so the the, the position of the um, uh, on on the substrate. Um, again, this is simulation, but uh, now the experiment is basically just measuring the thermal conductivity as a function of um, of laser power and and sort of different. Uh, uh, super lattice structure. So, so this is the, the the main result is that what we show here is the, the the basically the thermal conductivity as a function of interphase density. So interphase density is again inverse of the period. And so the more the the more interfaces you have, the lower the thermal conductivity, which is not very surprising. But uh, you know that and and that the unfortunately in the, this experiment we were limited to to about forty. Uh, six uh, nanometers. So we, we couldn't go to, to sort of the, our smallest um, uh, lattice uh, constants yet. Um, but it turns out that, you know, that this can be understood quite well by just uh, modeling the system as being, you have carbon 12, and then you have carbon 13. And in between, you have some uh, thermal resistance due to, to the mismatch in, um, in phonon structure. And uh, and then you can come up with sort of a relatively simple expression of the thermal conductivity, which is sort of this equation here, uh, which depends only on the, on the resistance, on the interface resistance between carbon 12 and carbon 13, and the, the, um, the periodic uh, uh, lattice constant. And then, uh, and also depends on, on the thermal, on the pure thermal conductivity of, of, of carbon uh, 12. And, and the fit is quite good, except that uh, for, for small lattices, when, when, we, when, you, when you get to small lattices, the, the fitting, the, the, the equation doesn't work as well, but the simulation, because then you have to take into account that the, the, um, the spot size is actually a finite size. Uh, and so now we can compare sort of a pure graphene, which is this one, the thermal conductivity of pure graphene was, let's say, uh, random graphene, which is quite low in thermal conductivity. And if you take a, a, a small super lattice, they're very similar to the random case. While if you take a large uh, random lattice, um, it's sort of in between. And so, but but you know, so so it does show that both the super lattice and randomness actually decreases thermal conductivity of, of uh, graphene, which means that maybe you can use this sort of for interesting thermoelectric applications. So, so this was the sort of the last point I want to make. And then uh, just summarizing sort of what I, what I showed is that um, I basically started, you know, showing you how, how, you, how we make these uh, 2D super lattices in graphene. There's this sort of interesting happening, interesting things happening in the, in the phonon band structure. 
uh, we looked, we, we were able to measure directly the, the hot electron scattering mean free pass. And then finally, we used this sort of new, uh, real space Raman spectroscopy to understand the, the, the Raman data. And, uh, you know, one, one possible application is sort of a reduced thermal conductivity of these uh, super lattices. So with this, uh, I thank you a lot for um, listening and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you, you might have. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, uh, yes, we are open for questions. Um, I think that uh, people just start talking. Is that right? Um, no, um, so we have a chat window, so people can type their questions into the chat. Um, we have one okay. question. Um, it's besides the mass difference, does the isotope change any other basic lattice um, phono phononic properties to interatomic um, inter um, interactions remain the same as the pure graphene? Yeah, so um, what is interesting is that because we, we see this very linear dependence on uh, isotope concentration versus um, Raman peak position, it shows that uh, unlike in diamond where, where there's actually quite a bit of a change, it's not, it's not linear. Uh, so, so the expectation is that there's probably a little bit of electron phonon scanning which will, uh, which will appear through the difference in masses. But uh, it's really only via the electron phone interaction that you can actually get something happening, uh, which is sort of a non trivial in terms of the electron system. And so, so from a phonon point of view, it, it really, yeah, so, so there's really definitely an electron uh, that there's, there's clearly a big difference in sort of phonon um, structure. But for electrons, the, the difference is expected to be quite small, but, but not zero. Uh, but how big it is, it's actually, we, we don't really know. We can only say that it's relatively small. Um, so, so then there's another effect, which again is, is not clear. No one, we haven't been able to measure anything really significant there. Is, there might also be something related to the, to the nuclear spin. So carbon 13 has a nuclear spin, but not the carbon 12. And so, so that it can also be an interaction via the nuclear spins with electron spin, which could also modify some structure, both in the phonons and the electrons. But uh, the, those are expected to be quite small. So, so it's really not, um, so, so the effects are, are relatively small, let's say outside for, of, the, of just the, the mass change. Um, I'm not sure if that was sort of the answer you're looking for, but yeah. Uh, and we do have another question from Christina. She says, neat stuff. Um, what is the feasibility of making a 2D super lattice like this with a 2D material that isn't graphene? Yeah, so, so in, in graphene, uh, it works, let's say, so well, although it, you know, it's, it's uh, relatively easy to do in the sense that um, because you, CBD grows sort of uh, laterally or, you know, in, in sort of circles, you, you, you're growing these single crystals uh, uh, as a function of time, and so you can really tune that. And there's not many other 2D systems where you can, which you can grow in, in, in a, such a nice sort of a, a way at, at, at least for, for, for larger um, uh, crystal sizes. So in graphene, you can grow, grow, grow them up to millimeter sized, and uh, so you can really make sort of big devices with that. But uh, all the other, other 2D materials, some of them you can actually do CBD and, and uh, grow them. So I, I expect that other materials where you can actually do growth on them, it should be possible too, but it's much harder because we, we don't have like the same quality of, of, of sort of a, uh, Grows as we have in graphene yet, you know, and that's something which might change. Um, but we have to find sort of new recipes of how to grow other materials, and as well as let's say graphene and 2D materials. So it's really an limitation of of finding good ways to to grow sort of um, uh, the, these materials. Um. Okay, we have another question. Um, so both carbon-12 and carbon-13 are both naturally occurring and stable. So most regular graphene samples people produce are the random isotope graphene you showed. Yeah, so, so naturally there, there's sort of always um, a few percent, well, one or two percent of carbon-13 mixed into the carbon-12. Um, and so if you just take a, it depends a lot on, on, on what what your carbon source is. And you can grow graphene with all kinds of carbon sources. And um, uh, if you use, let's say, natural carbon source, then yes, it, it will be 
uh, slightly mixed. So you only be a little bit of carbon-13 in there. But actually when you buy, a, typically when you buy a carbon, like a, like a methane gas bottle, it will usually be isotopically relatively pure. So that they are, they're also purified. So I, I think most of the CVD grown graphene is typically carbon, relatively pure carbon-12 and not that much carbon-13. But if it's other sources of carbon, then yeah, it all, it all depends on, on the carbon source you're using. Um, but it's, it's relatively easy to find pure carbon-12 uh, carbon sources. So, so that's uh, quite common. Okay, and we have another question. Um, why focus on the highest frequency uh, phonon, the D band? Yeah, so so the it's an interesting question. So I, I think the um, the high frequency phonons are the most sensitive to uh, a mass change, and the reason is that the the mass difference uh, is multiplied essentially. If you look at the the equations, um, basically the, the frequency is 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 a prefactor in front of the the mass difference, and so so the higher the frequency, the more the the mass difference matters. And so, so most, a lot of the effects you're going to see are, are going to start. You're going to start seeing them at at the at the high energy phonons. But actually, uh, very recently, we were looking at the acoustic phonons, and we actually see where, in, in a way, you could argue it, it's also quite interesting. And and we, we we seem to be seeing that, looking at acoustic phonons, there's uh, much you know the the super lattice effect is much weaker, and so you're only going to see stuff happening at much uh, large, you already see something happening at sort of much larger uh, super lattices periods. So, so things start to change only, let's say, at 100 nanometers or 50 nanometers. So, so, uh, so in that sense, looking at low energy phonons is also, I think, very interesting. And, uh, and the advantage of low energy phonons is that they, they live much longer. And so the coherence times of low energy phonons will be much longer. And so, so you, you can expect sort of more sort of quantum-like effects happening in low energy phonons. So I think it's very interesting actually to look at the low energy phonons. And that's something we would definitely uh, right now looking at. And uh, I think it's, it's very, quite a very promising uh, avenue. And, and the, actually the thermal conductivity is mostly a low energy phonon effect because thermal conductivity is mostly because of, um, of, of, of acoustic phonons. And so, so it's really the low energy phonons which will dominate the physics of, um, of thermal conductivity. Um, and so the, they are important too, except that Raman, there's not many Raman peaks which are related to acoustic phonons. And uh, I don't know, maybe, I think that these are really nice peaks, but if, if I go back to maybe, let's say, actually the, this is sort of the, uh, yeah, so, so, so here I show, for example, the D prime plus D3 uh, phonon peak, uh, and and the D prime is an optical phonon, but D3 is an acoustic phonon, and so the, this one actually shows a nice splitting, also of carbon 12, carbon 13, and um, and the D3 has a, is actually quite a small low energy phonon. It's like 300 uh, wave wave numbers, so so uh, we actually do see them, but they're much weaker, and so so the resolution we have is is not as good as for sort of a the, the D prime, which is a much stronger phonon peak, yeah. but but they're they're definitely uh, the acoustic phonons do play an interesting uh, uh, role here too. Great. Um, so we have two more questions, um, but it is two thirty. Do you have a couple more minutes? To... Yeah, sure. I'm I'm happy to continue. Okay. Um, so we'll just take these last two questions. Um, so Eric said there are experience, uh, experiments using edges as defects in producing. Uh, D Raman photon, um, an STM tip scans near the edge and the signal dies um, as the tip is moved away. It, is this related to your super lattice work? Yeah, so, so uh, um, let me see if I have a good picture. So, so yeah, so if I take this uh, real space picture here, uh, maybe the, the bigger one. Oh. Um, so, so, so imagine now, you know, instead of having a, a super lattice, but I, I basically cut off um, so sort of my, my structure somewhere. Then, then clearly, you know, uh, to, to understand what, what, what you know, de depending on, on how I, I do this cutting of my, uh, of my uh, sample, uh, you would expect the, the, the phonon process to be strongly influenced by that. So, so I definitely think that, there's, um, that, that there must be a strong link between, so I think there's probably other ways to, 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 to also uh, 
look at this in terms of the edge. And actually, Denis Basco actually has also um, looked at the theory behind the, especially the deep peak in, in the presence of defects, um, how, how that's, that's in, 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 in the presence of an edge, sorry. Uh, and so, so def definitely, I think this picture is, is, I think, quite relevant also for, 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 for an edge structure. Uh, we haven't really looked into that in detail because uh, we we're most, mostly concentrating on the super lattice. But I, I do think yes, that that's actually very relevant. And uh, I'm actually curious to look at the, in more detail this STM uh, uh, data to see, see uh, you know, uh, well, what the links are. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, the definitely an edge is, is, is sort of has a similar aspect because anything you do in real space will actually influence then the, the phonon spectrum. Uh, Great. Um, and then last question is any possible observation of three or four phonon mixing? Yes, so so we, we have, um, so this is the, some of the data we have on, on higher number of phonons. And so it, it gets more complicated, but um, so, so, so this is an example where this is a Raman peak which involves three phonons. And this is a Raman peak which involves uh, four phonons. And so they're, they're very high energy. And so if you do the same approach, um, what happens is that when, when you have four phonons, you start getting a lot of possible, um, you know, you can have uh, three carbon 12 phonons, one carbon 13, you can have two and two, you can have zero and four. So, uh, so th this is what, what these sort of uh, green lines are. And it, it can get a little messy. So, so this is sort of trying to, to plot in the 4D case, uh, showing that you know, well, these are all the possible lines of combination phonons. And there's quite a bit. And so, so we don't have yet the resolution to really you know, see distinct peaks. But hopefully, you know, by, by doing sort of a, maybe a better job in the Raman, we might actually be able to resolve these sort of higher order phonon ones uh, better. Uh, there's an interesting thing with the true phonon, which is, uh, which is sort of similar. You also have a lot of combination peaks, uh, two different, a lot of different possible combination with three phonons. And, uh, but um, there's a difference between a strong and weak contribution. So, so if you're, if your virtual state you're creating in, in this sort of three phonon process is, is far away from your, uh, uh, for your from your electron dispersion, the, the amplitude will be lowered. So the farther you away from the, the natural sort of dispersion, uh, the, 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 the smaller the, so the, the intensity essentially goes like one, you know, somehow one, one, one divided by the, the energy difference between your, your virtual state and, and let's say your, um, uh, you, 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 your real state. And so, so these black lines are corresponding to actually virtual states, which are quite far away from the, um, uh, from the broadening of your energy states. And so, so we expect them to be quite a bit weaker. And that's why uh, we still see mostly two peaks, even though we, ha we, we, we have three phonons uh, coming, playing in there. An interesting one is the D plus D prime, which is one, the D plus D double prime, one is an optical phonon and the other one is an acoustic phonons. And there you see that uh, you also see the sort of this third peak appearing, um, which is, but, but the, there's in principle, carbon 12, carbon 13 is not the same as carbon 13 and carbon 12. So they have a slight sort of a slightly different energies because they're different types of phonons. And so that's why you have four lines. Um, with three phonons in principle, you would have uh, six lines. Uh, I'm not, uh, yeah. uh, I think six lines, yes. Um, but uh, for, for two phonons, you can have in principle of uh, four possible lines and, and you actually do see this sort of uh, indication of, of, a, of a central peak. So yes, so, so I think uh, that the approach is, works for any number of phonons and uh, the higher order of phonons, you're gonna get more and more stuff, interesting stuff happening potentially. Um, but it's, it's harder to resolve experimentally at least. Great. Well, thank you so much. This was wonderful. And we'll be posting this to um, our YouTube channel so people can watch it who missed it. Thank okay. you, Michael, for a wonderful yeah. talk and really intriguing and so much uh, to learn from this. Thank you very much. Well, th thanks again, uh, everyone, for listening. And uh, it was a pleasure to, to talk about this exciting stuff. <laughs> it took us a while to try to understand this. So it was kind of happy to, I think, get somewhere. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.
Bye.